Hey everybody, what's going on? We got some Izzy Stradlin news. So this is the most recent photo of Izzy Stradlin that's been taken. This is from December 9th of 2016. Uh, this is in a recording studio. Uh, this has actually been tweeted up by Wayne Sto Stokely. He was in the same recording studio as Izzy, snapped a picture. Now it's not clear as to whether this is uh, the actual same uh, session where they recorded Call Me The Breeze. So just before Christmas, Izzy put out a cover of the JG, JJ Kale song, Call Me The Breeze. Uh, this is maybe when it was recorded around that time in early December, or it could have been maybe some other batch of songs he's working on. But if you guys are wondering what Izzy's up to, he's in the recording studio, he's probably growing avocados too. Let's go on to our other piece of Guns N' Roses news. Uh, this is actually another excerpt from Mick Wall's book that uh, has made the headlines on Alternative Nation. So it's about the two women who reunited Guns N' Roses. And, uh, you know, if you would ask me which two women helped reunite them, I would have said, slash his girlfriend Megan Hodges who he's currently dating and I would have said Perla who Axel split with and she was sort of a catalyst for a lot of the reunion beginning so uh, I'm not going to read the entire excerpt I've linked to it down below but the basic summary of it is that you know slash divorced his wife on December 30th 2014 and Axel didn't like his wife and uh, Perla was Slash's manager and I imagine they probably had to deal a lot with Guns N' Roses related stuff and there was probably some sour grapes there as well so soon after Slash filed for divorce he, apparently he they had been separated since june of 2014 so he had hooked up with his new girlfriend megan hodges it was actually the same megan who slash dated back in the late 80s i finished reading slash's book he talked a lot about his relationship with megan and it was kind of a weird relationship because a lot of the time he was using heroin he was drinking a lot and you know they had a good relationship during that time and she didn't really know what he was up to because she lived a pretty clean life and then once there was one story slash told where you know he got clean and he finally realized like okay i don't really have any chemistry with this girl she's kind of bland and boring and he dumped her but according to the actual excerpt from mick wall's book it's megan who's the one who dumped slash it's kind of hard to say what story is true but either way they ended up stop they stopped dating in 1989 or so so uh, when she met slash she was 18 years old in 1988 and this is a story told by their former manager alan niven and uh, basically they said that coming together with Megan unlocked another door for Slash, suggests Niven. So as you guys know, Megan is best friends with Erin Everly, who was Axl Rose's ex-wife. And she's also featured in this video, Sweet Child of Mine. So apparently Erin and Axl were once again talking together and Slash dating Megan only paved the way for Axl and Slash to begin talking once again after 20 years. Now, before we talk about Erin Everly and her history with Axl Rose and Guns N' Roses, let's talk about what the actual excerpt talks about. So, the idea of a Guns N' Roses reunion was actually backed up by Ricky Warwick. He's the former Almighty singer who's now fronting the resurrected Irish rockers Thin Lizzy. So, when Thin Lizzy supported Guns N' Roses in 2012, Ricky and Axl became friends, and Warwick told Classic Rock Magazine that Axl was quite realistic about the possibility of a reunion, saying, who knows, he had fond memories of it. It always was, it was a case of, we'll see where the road takes us. It was never over my dead body. And it's, you know, it's funny, it's that this is not the only story we've heard about this. As you guys know, Sebastian Bach has a new book out. He was doing some press for it. And he said every time you'd hang out with Axel, like during the 2010 tour, whenever he, or 2010 through 2012, Axel would always say, never say never. So it seems like, you know, even though Axel publicly was saying that he would never do a reunion, privately he had different opinion about it. And it's kind of like that saying that, that came out during the U.S. election, you know, where Hillary Clinton had a private opinion, then she had a public opinion. It seems like it's very similar to what Axel was doing when it came to the topic of a Guns N' Roses reunion. So, unbeknownst to the public, by the summer of 2015, Axel, Slash, and Duff were already in communication. Although it wasn't directly, it was mostly through lawyers and business managers. According to Alan Niven, who remains close to Slash, he said Duff did most of the spade work at that stage. And this is a statement that's been backed up by uh, the band's old friend Mark Cantor, who said the bassist had acted as a main peacemaker between Slash and Axel, and he said that Duff was a big part of them getting back together. He also said he's working with Axel again, and it's a, he's a good middleman, and there was no one else who communicated with Axel and Slash other than Duff. And then Duff. So when Axel was venting about Slash to Duff, Duff was able to help Axel see things through, through Slash's eyes. At the same time, however, guys, both Axel's Lead GNR and Slash's solo band were set to release their own live DVDs. Both featured classic Guns N' Roses songs that required the other party to sign off ahead of the release. Whereas in the past, Axel would most likely never have allowed his old nemesis the privilege, this time he agreed to do it seemingly without objection. So that's 
the excerpt in summer, basically summarize the excerpt that's been put out by Mick Wall as part of his new book, The Last of the Giants. If you guys want to read the entire thing, I've linked to it down below in the uh, in the actual description box. So let's talk a bit about Erin Everly and her relationship with Axl Rose and Guns N' Roses, because they have a long, tumultuous relationship involving lawsuits and allegations and memorabilia being sold. So let's talk a bit about that if you guys aren't familiar with it. So Erin Everly was Axl Rose's first wife. They had been married for a really brief period in uh, the early 90s, and they basically separated uh, seven months after getting married. And Erin Everly is the daughter of Don Everly of the Everly Brothers. And uh, basically, once they got separated, Axel had tried to communicate or contact Everly for more than a year, sending her flowers, letters, and even caged birds. Now, she actually sued Axel in March of 1994, uh, accusing him of physical and emotional assault and sexual battery. And as you guys know, around this time, he was also involved in a lawsuit with Stephanie Seymour, and I believe Everly had actually testified in the Stephanie Seymour trial. And both lawsuits were settled out of court. Axel apparently agreed to a settlement of more than a million dollars with uh, Aaron Everly. Now, the actual trial and their relationship was actually written about in a 1994 issue of People magazine. I've linked to the entire article if you guys want to go read it. It's uh, pretty hard to read some of this stuff. But if you guys are interested in Axel's personal life, go check it out. Uh, there's also been a bunch of news about Aaron Everly over the past couple of years as well. Now in 2011, Guns N' Roses were playing a concert in Atlanta where Everly lives. And she was spotted actually at the Guns N' Roses concert by one of the fans there. And now a lot of fans were wondering, oh, she reconciled with Axel. Does Axel know she's there? You know, that stuff was still up in the air. And it's really not been explained as to whether they'd reconcile at that point in time. It seems like now they have. So back in 2012, we also had a really strange story uh, from TMZ. So at that time, there was an LA-based photographer named Laura London. She had an exhibit in downtown LA called Once Upon a Time, Axl Rose Was My Neighbor. And she'd claimed her main piece, which is a photograph you see here, it was of a garage door with Sweet Child O'Die. You are one of many nothing special spray painted on it. It's a picture of Axel's garage from years ago. So originally Axel sent a cease and desist letter, basically claiming that what the photographer had was never written by Axel and it was just false and, and lies and fabricated. And the letter, which was drafted by Axel's attorney, also demanded an apology and wanted the art show canceled. Now, from whatever I could gather, the art show was never canceled, but Erin Everly, shortly after the story broke, sent her own cease and desist letter to the same LA photographer and claimed that Axel never wrote this stuff on her garage door. Instead, as she claimed that the actual graffiti was written by neighborhood kids. And then in 2013, uh, there was a story about Erin Everly. Uh, basically selling Axel's uh, love letters and wedding videos as well as other memorabilia. So in 2013 there was an auction which you can actually go see some of the memorabilia that's that was up for sale at the time. I've linked to it down below. They included candid photos of Rose, some of which were from his childhood letters that Rose wrote to her, handwritten song lyrics, clothing he wore in music videos and even their marriage certificate. There's even their marriage video and there's some stills from it you guys can go look at. And then if you look at the actual items on the auction site, you can actually see what the winning bids were. So the candid photos went for $5,000. Uh, there was also the um, uh, t-shirt that Axel once wore. That one went for $4,800. There was also the marriage tape, which went for under $2,000. And then there was this pants that Axel rose, which also went for just under $2,000 as well. So I've linked to that down below if you guys want to go check it out. 